At my website, I've added my illustration of Covenant Amillennialism. And here it is. And like in the dispensational chart, this chart shows the history of God's dealings with the earth. And all the way on the left, it starts with the creation. And then we have the fall. And from that period until the cross, I have it really generically called the old economy of the covenant of grace. And from the cross to the end of time, I have that called the new economy of the covenant of grace. Now, in reality, these are two different covenants here, the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant prophesied in Jeremiah 31. But in this system, the biblical covenants are reduced to a subset of what they would call divine outworkings of the covenant of grace. So the biblical covenants count for very little in this system. The covenants that matter are shown right here. Now first you'll notice that under the green creation area on the left of the screen, that era there is described as the covenant of works. And after the fall, all the way to the end, you see there the covenant of grace. This is key because what covenant amillennialism seeks to do is to show that a straight shot A to B occurs from the fall to the end of time. One linear plan of God dealing with one people of God is underway the entire time in scriptural history. This is a major assumption of covenant amillennialism. It's the driving force behind what they believe. They feel they are providing you with a comprehensive understanding of scripture, but they only lead people into utter confusion. Now, under the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, we find the covenant of redemption. And this is a third hypothetical covenant they embrace in this system. And they believe this was an agreement in eternity past between the persons of the Trinity. And the agreement was that there would be an elect and there would be a fall and so forth. So I indicate that this covenant is pre-existing and the underlying force here by extending it back further than creation. You see that? Now, underneath all this, I show the covenantalist ecclesiology. And basically what you see here is that the church has existed from Adam all the way through to the great white throne. One people of God, one people in view, and one plan. One straight shot from Adam to the end of time. Any righteous ever who have ever lived are regarded as part of the church. Now, in this portion of the chart, I show Christ's Plan B Kingdom. And I refer it to that way because when speaking of the revelation of the mystery through the Apostle Paul, these amillennialists want to say, well, the way dispensationalists understand it can't be, right? That would be a Plan B. So let's just apply that standard evenly and talk about their Plan B kingdom a little bit. They believe that Christ came on the scene offering the kingdom, but Israel rejected him and killed him. But God just went ahead and established his kingdom anyway, except it was a different kind of kingdom this time. Because Israel had done what she had done. So now God changes Israel. And you'll have to press an amillennialist to really get them to tell you when that occurred. 
but they would say it acts too, okay? They think that Israel was metamorphosed into a new kind of entity at Acts 2. It was no longer a national identity now, but rather it was made up of Jew and Gentile, no matter where, who simply believed in Christ. You see how instead of a new body forming, known as the church, they have the one body being transformed in nature. In order to believe that we are in the kingdom now, the Abrahamic covenant needs to be redefined. It no longer contains promises concerning a particular land and a particular people. It has to be spiritualized. Any theology that tampers with the Abrahamic covenant is immediately called into question, my friends. Furthermore, the Davidic covenant needs to be redefined. It no longer refers to the throne of David in Zion, but rather to the throne of God in heaven. Any theology that tampers with the Davidic covenant is immediately called into question, my friends. Resurrection redefined. Now, all amillennialists deny the two resurrections and teach a single universal resurrection at the end of all things. But when taken consistently to its full preterist ends, resurrection would also be denied. And this would only be consistent with what their father Origen taught. Now, obviously, none of this is possible unless the natural meaning of Scripture is abandoned. And that's what we have with this movement. We have people who interpret Scripture in a plain and readily apparent manner in all cases except eschatology. And that is precisely what we have with this theology. They interpret all of the Bible in a plain, straightforward manner, except for these parts of the Bible here, pertaining to the kingdom and the second advent and so forth. Only here do we find these people playing around with language and changing what the Bible says. Now, if you look down below, you see here a contradiction in amillennialism that will never go away and that they just simply can't answer. They don't know how the Great Tribulation fits into their scheme. Now, I have three options here. First, the Great Tribulation from a historicist amillennialist perspective. That would be the top red dimension there that stretches all the way from the cross to the conflagration. And this view would make the Great Tribulation one and the same as the Kingdom Age. So we know that's not right. The second option under that and to the left would be a brief period around AD 70. And they would call the Great Tribulation from a preterist amillennialist perspective. This places the Great Tribulation some 40 years after the Spirit Kingdom began and contradicts all of prophecy, which specifically places the Great Tribulation prior to the Kingdom Age. This is found in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Daniel 12, the Olivet Discourse, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 20, Jeremiah 30, Zechariah 13, 7 to 9, and so forth. And the third option here would be that the Great Tribulation is a brief period at the close of the kingdom. And this view would look to Revelation 20 
at the final revolt and suggest that perhaps that corresponds with the Great Tribulation. That, of course, does not work because we know that those who refused to take the mark and so forth were raised to reign with Christ a thousand years and that this brief rebellion occurs at the end of the thousand years. So, good luck to you amillennialists out there as you try to solve this problem. We've been waiting for an answer for hundreds of years. When are we going to get one?